Why don't we stand together as we read God's word and honor, honor his word this morning. In Acts chapter number 2, verse number 41, we'll start there. Acts 2, 41. The Bible says, and they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Aren't you thankful that we're a church that preaches the word of God? We see lives changed by the power of the gospel. And even this morning, we saw two people identify with the Lord in believer's baptism. Aren't you thankful for that? And let's not get over that. Uh, here it is, a 4th of July weekend, and uh, we see people responding to the gospel and identifying with the Lord in, in, in that first step of obedience. Verse 42 now, and they, those that were saved and baptized, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all believed were together, and had all things common. They sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men, as every man had need. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking of bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Father, we thank you for your word. I pray that you would encourage us today and uplift our spirits and energize us so that we could be the church that you want us to be. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. How many of you would identify with being a good starter? Maybe it's a project at home, but man, you, you tackle that project. You're a good starter. Maybe in the beginning of the new year, you're, you have all these goals listed out. You know, you're going to read your Bible through and, and you're going to have a prayer list and, and you're going to lose, you know, 25 pounds this year. You're going to exercise and boy, you have all these goals and, and you do really good for about two or three weeks. And then somewhere along the line, you get a little discouraged, you get off track a little bit, and, and you're just not really a good finisher. You know, and I believe that as a church, as believers, we ought to be good finishers. And I believe as Christ followers, that ought to be our aim, that ought to be our purpose, is that we want to finish the race that God has called us to run. We need to go the distance. You think about Old Testament Bible characters. Now, there were some that were very good finishers. Uh, you know, there was Joshua, there was Joseph, you know, there was Elijah, Elisha, uh, there was Daniel. And, but then you think, there's, there was a lot of good starters in the Old Testament, but they didn't finish well. You, you think of Moses, who lost his temper and failed to enter into the Promised Land. You think Saul, the first king of Israel, he had a good start. He started strong. But fear and pride got the best of him. Think of David, a man after God's own heart. Boy, he started off really good. But he didn't finish too good. Sin hindered him from running his final stretch. You think of Samson, who was mightily used by God but failed because he could not control his passion for women. Now on the flip side, if you look at the, the New Testament, most of the Bible characters in the New Testament started poorly. Think about the disciples. Man, they were always you know, bickering and fighting and wanting to be the best and, and they're comparing themselves with one another and they wanted you know, that prominent position. But then something radically took place in their lives that really changed their direction in, in their life. And that was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And from that point forward, the disciples became strong finishers. They went the distance. You know, you think about two of them. You think about Peter. Peter, early on in his ministry, was obsessed with possessing prominent position in God's kingdom. Even during the final hours of our Savior before his crucifixion, Peter denied the Lord. He denied the Lord three times. And to close out that matter, he finally just cussed. Peter was not doing a good job in his race. 
But something took place in Peter's life after he encountered the resurrected Savior. As we read this morning, Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, and over 3,000 people came to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Peter radically was changed by the resurrected Savior. You think of the Apostle Paul. Wow. Talking about a bad start. He persecuted Christians for their faith. He oversaw the murder of Stephen, who became the first martyr of, for his belief in Jesus Christ. But on the road to Damascus, his life was transformed. God even changed his name from Saul to Paul. And Paul became a mighty soldier for Jesus Christ. You think what the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter number 2, uh, chapter 4, verse number 7. Paul describes his own race, his own life. He says, I fought a good fight. I have finished my course, and I've kept the faith. Wow, Paul was a strong finisher. He went the distance. Now, if you and I are going to go the distance, we must realize and we must expect that we will face some opposition. It's not always going to be smooth sailing. We're going to have some opposition as we run our race and if we endeavor to go the distance for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, over in Europe, they're, they're conducting right now the, the Tour of France and is underway. And, and it's one of the, the highlights for anybody that is a cyclist. And they have repeated uh, um, uh, races throughout a, a two-week period. And, and boy, these riders face many different oppositions. They face headwinds. They face flat tires and maybe mental fatigue and the physical depletion because they are not hydrated. And maybe it's a, met, met, um, a mechanical problems. But this two, uh, last Saturday, something unbelievable took place. And probably all of you probably saw it on the internet or maybe on ESPN. And, but we got something we're going to show on the screens about what took place. I don't know what's happened there. Maybe they clipped the crowd, but whatever has happened, they are in a right mess down there at the moment now. How many riders? Let's hope. You can see right on the look like Tyler Terry. Near the front, watch him try to get around his teammate and go down. Oh, he might have clipped that spectator. He off the road. Oh, I think he went off the road. The road has got a nasty ridge on it there. Now, the question is, what's going to happen? How many people are going to get back up? Right, that sign right there, Phil. Left to your picture. Oh, my, oh my goodness <laughs> me. Oh, it was the sign that the rider in front hit. And that is the result. <laughs> Did you see me in that race? <laughs> I went crashing. You know what that sign said? That lady was so proud of getting on TV... And the problem that the, the sign was, was in German and French, kind of a mixture. And it said this, go grandma, grandpa. She was cheering her grandmother and grandfather on. And all of a sudden, because of that act of she's on TV, she caused that terrible wreck. Do you realize this? That there's many signs that this world puts before us that endeavors to get us off a of track. You think about our culture, our culture has signs. Our media has pop-up signs. The world, the flesh, the devil have signs. And they're all trying to pull us in and to redirect us to go into a different direction. First John chapter five says this, love not the world, neither things are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of this world. But verse 17 says this, and the world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Amen. Let me kind of rephrase that a little bit if you don't allow me to, to do that. But he that doeth the will of God goes the distance. We must realize that God's will will enable us to go the distance for his honor and for his glory. Now the question comes to our mind, how can we go the distance? How can we run our race and finish the race that God's called us to run? In our passage this morning, in Acts chapter number two, God gives us five disciplines 
that we need to make sure that we're infusing into our lives so that we can run the race that God's called all of us as believers to run. So let's look at this first discipline that God gives to us. We need to be celebrating the awesomeness of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Acts chapter two, verse 43, and fear came upon every soul. Verse 47 says this, praising God. In this early church, these believers had a sense of awe of who Jesus is. A a reverence, a fear of God, a, a respect for who he is and what he's done. Oh, in our world today, we stand in awe of mere men and women who have accomplished much in the arenas of maybe business, politics, maybe entertainment, or even sports. Recently, probably several months ago, first time I heard this comment or this statement, um, uh, Tom, uh, is Tom, yeah, Tom Bradley. What's his first name? Brady, Tom Brady, excuse me, Tom Brady. He was called the GOAT, and I'm thinking, the GOAT? I mean, he can't be the GOAT. I mean, he, he's like, I mean, he's a superstar. But I didn't realize the GOAT man's the greatest of all time. And we cheer him on because, you know, he won seven Super Bowls. And then there's, you know, in basketball, excuse me, from Laker fans, Michael Jordan, being from Chicago, amen. Um, six world championships, three championships in a row, two times. And then for golf, you know, the GOAT is, you know, Tiger Woods, who have won most PGA champions uh, tournaments than any other golfer. You look at these men and they're, you know, they're, they would call them the goats. You know, they're the greatest of all time. But this church here, the one that they stood in awe of was not the religious leaders, not their political leaders, not their athletes that they worship. No, but it was Jesus Christ. They stood back and they cheered on him because of who he was and what he accomplished in and through his life. The one that created the world, the one that spoke this universe into existence, they stood in awe of him. In Psalms 147, verse 1, praise you the Lord, for it is good to sing praises unto our God, for it is a pleasant and praise is comely. He healeth the broken heart, he bindeth up their wounds, he telleth the number of the stars, he calleth them all by their names. Great is our Lord and great a, and of great power. His understanding is infinite. The Lord lift up the meek. He, cast, he casteth the wicked down to the ground. Sing unto the Lord with thanksgiving. Sing praise unto the, unto the harp, unto our God. In Isaiah chapter number 40, the Bible says, To whom then will we liken me? Or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who hath created these things that bringeth out their host by number. He calleth them all by names, by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power, not one faileth. Peter preached on this special day, in in the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, and he draws attention uh, to the awesomeness of Jesus Christ. Look in your Bibles in Acts 2, verse number 22. Acts 2, 22, he says this in his sermon, ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among, among, whom, among you by miracles and wonders and signs by which God did by him in the midst of you as ye yourselves also know. That word approved comes from two Greek words. It means to separate and to expose to eyes or to give evidence. So God set aside Jesus Christ so that we would have the evidence that Jesus is the living Christ. He is the one that conquered sin, death, and the grave. And because of that, you and I ought to worship him and praise him and lift him up in two specific areas. His life was approved. The Bible says in John 6, 38, for I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. In John 8, 29, and he that sent me is with me, the Father hath not left me alone. For I always do those things that please him. Wow, what a testimony of our Savior. He always did those things that were pleasing 
to his, his heavenly father. He set his side, his own agenda, and his whole purpose was to run the race and to go the distance and to go to Calvary for you and for me. His life was approved, but not only that, but also his sacrifice was approved. Look at verse number 23 then. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and the foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it is not possible that he should be holden of it. Man, think about this. We celebrate Jesus Christ as because he's an awesome and he's a wonderful savior. He conquered sin. He, he's the one that sets us free and he brings freedom to our soul and to our lives. The Bible says you should know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Amen. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth. Man, we ought to celebrate the awesomeness of Jesus. But we see the second discipline we ought to infuse in our lives. We need to be constructing our lives daily. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. It's typically the norm for us to start off good. And along the way, we begin to waver. I think different areas of my life, and one area of my life, I know I start off really good, but it doesn't take me long to waver. And that is in the area of dieting. I don't know if you're an expert dieter, um, I'm not. I do really good from about six o'clock in the morning to about 11 o'clock in the afternoon. I do really good within that, that, that framework of time right there. I remember my wife now, she reads all these different articles about weight loss and I mean, she has all these different diets. I mean, she, she is a champion of losing 10 pounds in 10 minutes. I mean, she loves those types of diets. And she put me on one of those diets because she didn't want to diet alone. She likes the companionship. And so we're dieting together and this diet was called the cabbage soup diet. Now, just kind of let that sink in. The cabbage soup diet. It's exactly what I just said. And that, 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 that meal, that breakfast, you can, you, listen, you can eat all the cabbage soup you want. You can eat all you want. And, and, you know, if you like to eat rubber, you know, rubber tires, you know, that's basically what it tastes, for, tastes like. But there's no noodles in there. There's no meat in there. All you can put in that cabbage soup is salt and pepper. And may I say, I put a lot of salt and pepper in there. I'm not sure if the salt was any good for me, but I tell you what, I had to add some flavor to that soup. And I had two big bowls of that cabbage soup. And you know, I walked away, I was full. I, and I, and I, kind of, I got probably kind of puffed up a little bit. I think, you know what, I could do this. I could do this. And it, it wasn't after just a few hours, man, I was starving. And all I was thinking about, man, at noon, we're gonna have cabbage soup <laughs> again. And I'm thinking, no way. There's no way I'm going to be able to do this. And then I'm thinking my wife, she, she said, oh, we got to do this together. I need your encouragement. And I thought, I got to do this. So, so, I, so I made some visits on the west side of town, off of Avenue I, about 20th Street West to be exact. And there's a restaurant there that was, you know, I heard there, I saw a vision. I heard the voice, Come. Dine in and out with me. <laughs> so I go through the drive-thru and I order a double-double, amen. <laughs> Grilled onions, cheese, yes, french fries, and bless God, a Diet Coke, amen. <laughs> Boy, I tell you what, I devoured all that up, so I ran home, and it was about 12, 15 or so, and I said, I got, I got our soup together, and I said, honey, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not hungry. That soup was still holding me over from this morning. <laughs> She looked at me and says, you already broke it, didn't you? What did you eat? I, I, I guess I just the guilt on my face. You know, I, I just couldn't continue on that. But I'm thankful that this early church, that they continued. They continued in the apostles' doctrine. Listen, if we're going to if we're going to go the distance, the only way we're going to be able to do that, church, is that we need to have a steady diet 
of God's word in our life. Amen. You know, the Bible says in James chapter one, it says, be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, and being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Now, in our, in our auditorium today, there's two types of people in our, our auditorium this morning. There are those that you will look into the mirror of God's word. And one thing about the mirror, the mirror does not lie. I'm sure all of us this morning, we looked into the mirror. And for us men, we looked at the mirror and we said, you know what? Not bad. <laughs> Every lady looked in the mirror and said this, oh, Lord Jesus, come quickly. <laughs> but, you know, we look into the mirror and we say, well, I got to do something. I got to shave. Got to comb my hair. Got to wash my face. And that's about all the guys do. Now, ladies, I have no idea what you all do. It takes us men five minutes to get ready. It takes you ladies five hours to get ready. But you begin that work, the, the pulling and the painting and, and all of that. And I'm, I'm thankful for every bit of it. But you, listen, when you look into the mirror, we know one thing, the mirror doesn't lie. And when you look in the mirror, you realize I've got to do some work. Because what this is reflecting to me is not perfection. So that's one group of people in our, our auditorium today. Or number two, you look through life through the window frame. And all you do is look at others. And what you do, you say, you know what? Ah, I see something wrong with him. Oh, I see something wrong with him. Oh, I see something wrong with her. And your whole approach to life is by pointing out the errors and the flaws and the shortcomings of other people. And this is how you live life. But God tells us if we're going to finish the course that God's called us to run, if we're going to go the distance, we must be a people that look into the mirror of God's word so it reflects to each and every one of us the flaws the shortcomings are sin that needs to be changed Amen. and confessed. So how can we construct our lives so that we can go the distance? First of all, we need to have a hunger for his word. A hunger for his word. Jeremiah said this, thy words were found and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Jesus said this in John 8, 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if you continue, that's a key word, in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. What's imperative is this, is not what you did three years ago, but what did you do this morning with God's word? God says, listen, if you want to be my disciple, if you want to be a devoted one, one that follows me, we must hunger and thirst after God's word. But not only that, but we need to have a humble, we need to be humble in our walk. James 4, 6 says this, but he give more grace. Therefore he saith, God resists the proud, but he gives grace unto the humble. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. This past week, I read this verse in the book of Proverbs. These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven is abomination unto him. What's that first abomination? A proud look. Humility comes into our life when we honestly evaluate our life in the light of God's holiness. Psalms 32, verse 5, I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and my iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgivest the iniquity of my sin, 
Selah. Not only do we need to have a hunger for his word, we need to be humble in our walk. We need to be holy in our words. This is how we construct our lives. That's how we build strong lives that go the dis distance. The Bible says a good man are the good treasures of his heart bringing forth that which is good. And an evil man are the evil treasures of his heart bringing forth that which is evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. In other words, what's in your heart will come out through your lips. And that's why we need a hunger for God's word. And that's why we need to look into the mirror of God's word and continue therein and not be forgetful here. Because God's word is able to transform our hearts. Think about our words. We need to be cautious with our words. We need to be comforting with our words. We need to be constructing with our words. We need to be caring with our words. In Ephesians 4.29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. So as we think about going the distance, what are these disciplines that we need to be putting into our life? Number one, we need to be uh, celebrating the awesomeness of Jesus Christ. We need to be constructing our lives on a daily basis. And number three, we need to be connecting with other Christ followers. You know, Acts 2, verse 42 says this, and they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And verse 44 says, and they all that believed were together. Notice that the, the church is, is a called out assembly of believers. The church also is referred to as a body. Now, as you think about your body, your body has many parts to it. But our body functions together. And when one of your part of your body hurts, the whole body hurts. Now, the Bible says that, that the church is a body. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, but now have God said the members, every one of them in the body as it hath pleased him. Listen, this morning, you're very important to this body. God has placed you here. Well, not everybody knows my name. That's okay. God knows your name. And he's placed you here. You're a vital part of this body that is endeavoring to move forward for the cause of Christ. Listen, the church needs to gather together. Look what the Bible says in verse number 46. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking of bread and in prayers. Aren't you thankful that this world finally recognized that church is essential? When God has told us a long time ago in his word that we ought to be gathering together. The Bible says, and let us, get, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. The church needs to gather together. But listen, the church needs to get ready together. The church needs to get ready together. The Bible says in, in verse 25 of Hebrews 10, the second part of that, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as we see the day approaching. In Titus 2, verse number 11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we shall live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Why? Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We need to be getting ready. Gathering helps us to go the distance by reminding us that Jesus is coming. It reminds us. Hey, listen, I, I'm, just a, I'm just a pilgrim passing through. This is not my home. I'm just traveling through. One day I will be in heaven for all eternity. We're only here really for a few seconds when you compare that to eternity. The Bible says our life is like a vapor, it appeareth and it vanisheth away. Then we step into eternity and we'll be there forever. 
But gathering together reminds us of that, that our lives are fragile and we have a purpose to live for. But it reminds us and it realigns us. Because sometimes our hearts are prone to wander. Sometimes we do drift. And sometimes we get off track. But as we gather together, we get back in line with, with God's calling upon our lives and realize that, hey, I do have a race that God wants me to run. And I need to realign my life and make sure I'm going in the direction that God has directed my life. In the w- direction that God has directed your life. So reminding us and realigning us, but also re-energizing us. Do you ever just come to church and just being flat out tired? I mean, where you just kind of depleted? I mean, like, you don't even know if you could stand up. You're just glad when you could sit in your chair. And then Brother Williams says, well, let's stand up and sing. It's like, I don't want to. I'm, I'm just tired. But then, you know, isn't it amazing though, after a few songs, your heart gets lifted up? You hear pastor preach and Man, you feel like, wow, I, I'm, I'm energized. Hey, I'm feeling pretty good. You know why? That's what gathering together does. Amen. Amen. That's what church does. We're to gather together because it reminds us, it realigns us, and it energizes us. But only that, but this church, listen, this early church, they were praying together. And as we pray together as church, guess what? That enables us to go the distance. Look at verse number 42. And in prayers, there's incredible power and potential in prayer. Through prayer, we invite God of the universe into our situation and into our lives. Prayer changes things. More importantly, listen, prayer changes you and me. Through prayer, we have the opportunity to reach our full potential in Christ. The disciples said to Jesus, teach us to pray. As we grow in our prayer life and we become more alive and more engaged with, God, with what God is doing. Listen, none of us are perfect at prayer. But as we take steps to grow spiritually in our prayer life, the impact is incredible. Think about that lady holding that sign. Hey, Grandma, hey, Grandpa. Just that one decision to look at that camera and smile. And I'm sure she was so proud of her grandparents. But that one decision had a huge impact on many people. Think about the impact that we can make as a church when we bow before a holy God and we seek his face and we ask him to gather with us and to meet with us and to transform our lives through his presence and through his word. God will move mountains. God will will transform us into people of love and joy and peace through prayer. Let's become a people, let's become a church that prays together. Prayer expresses our dependency upon God. Prayer is our lifeline to his resources. Listen, the, 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 to go the distance, listen, you, you can't just fuel up in the morning and say, okay, I had my, my oatmeal. I drank my orange juice. I'm good for my race now. No, listen, as you pedal your bike and as you, you go through that race or just a, a, a ride, listen, your body begins to plead itself. You need to continually re... re um, Fueling your body. Otherwise, you're going to get depleted and you're going to, what they call, bunk. And basically what that is, that mentally and physically, you hit a wall and you can't even go 10 more feet. 
So constantly through that ride, you got you to be drinking, you got to be eating. The same thing with the Christian life. Our lifeline, that resource that's available to us is his word and also prayer. That's a resource that will enable us to go the distance. But number four, the fourth discipline that we need to make sure that's part of our lives is contributing to the furtherance of his purpose. The Bible says in verse 44, and all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. As I was studying and just meditating upon these two verses, this thought came to mind. The attitude of these early believers was one of generosity. This early church, one way they thought, you know, one way we can contribute is through our giving. It wasn't all what I can get and what I can can and what I'm going to sit on the can. But these believers had the attitude of they wanted to give. They wanted to be generous in expressing their love and appreciation for their God, but then also for their fellow, fellow believers. I love in 2 Corinthians chapter number 8 about the Macedonian believers. An amazing group of people who gave beyond their powers. How they gave beyond their own, their own resources. How's that possible? The Bible tells us, moreover, brethren, we do with the grace of God bestowed upon the churches of Macedonia. How that in great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. Just kind of let that sink in. I mean, here was a church that had great affliction, had deep poverty, but they had joy, and they gave liberally. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we should receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints, and this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord. There it is. That those believers at Macedonia, the way they were able to give and distribute is because they gave themselves to the Lord first. There's three ways that we all can be contributors. I hope that that's your desire, that you want to be a contributor. I, I, play, I grew up playing sports, and I'll be honest with you, I wasn't a very good athlete. I didn't have a lot of talent. Um, I played baseball, I think, for nine years. I always was hoping that I'd go to the Major League Baseball and play for the Cubs. Um, I never blew out my, left, my, my elbow. I was a left-handed pitcher, never blew out my elbow, never had shoulder problems. I just lacked one thing, talent. It's pretty important. <laughs> never got hurt. I just lacked talent. But you want know something? I wanted to contribute to my team. It was just cheering people on. In any way, I just wanted to contribute. Now I'm sure in this room today, there's, there's groups of people and throw, how can I contribute? How can I add value to this team? How can I add value to this body? Three quick ways. Number one, by prioritizing our time to further his mission.
One of the reasons why people say, well, I can't read my Bible, I'm so busy, or I can't spend a lot of time in prayer because, man, I got so many demands in my life. Do you want to be a contributor? We need, pre- we need to prioritize our time more effectively. Second way, by investing our treasures. And thirdly, by engaging our talents to further his mission. But let's, lastly, let's look at the final discipline that we ought to infuse into our lives. And that's communicating the life-changing message of Jesus. Now, I'm doing really good on time. I want you all to know that. It says 321 back there right now. So I, what that tells me, I have no idea what time it is. But I just, I just did look. So I looked at that at 321. Uh, either we're super, super late, and you're all mad at me because you missed your barbecue, or you're not even awake yet. Because it's 3.21 a.m., amen? <laughs> but the fifth discipline is this. is communicating the life-changing message of Christ. Look at verse 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Let's look at two ways that we can communicate his message. First of all, by our walk. By our walk. The way we live communicates our life to this world. Jesus told uh, had the great sermon on the mount in Matthew chapter 5. He says, you are the salt of the earth, and the, if the salt have lost its savior, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing, but is cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. Then he says, not only are you salt, but then he says, you are the light of the world. A city that is on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel or on a candlestick, and, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Listen, by the way we live our lives ought to reflect Jesus to this world. Now we know Jesus is the light of this world. But may I remind you that the moment you got saved, You became a child of that light. And we need to allow our lights to shine in this world. Not only by our walk, but also by our witness. But ye shall receive power after that. The Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and unto the utmost part of the earth. Our witness our walk ought to point others to Jesus Christ. Jesus has made it possible for everyone to experience spiritual liberty. Before coming to Christ, I was enslaved to sin. Oh, I was religious, I went to church, but I was in bondage. I had no hope for eternity. But then Jesus came in and he set me free. God said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God. Aren't you thankful that it's a gift? Aren't you thankful you don't have to earn it? Listen, Jesus paid the price, but he offers it to us as a free gift. Just a side note, if you haven't made that decision to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, may I say that that is your first step. 
That's how you get into the race. Is by receiving Christ as your Savior. And through that, you have the wonderful joy of knowing that if you were to die, that you would spend your eternity with him in heaven. Now, as believers, how are we doing with these disciplines? Are we celebrating the awesomeness of Jesus? Is there a sense of praise that burst forth out of our hearts and souls? Are we constructing our lives on a daily basis? Are we connecting with other believers? Are we contributing to further, for the furtherance of his purpose? Are we communicating the gospel message through our life and through our witness? This church, Acts chapter 2, they changed the world. Think about the potential that we have. If we take these five disciplines and infuse them into our lives, how we could change this valley for God's glory and for his honor.